morning. Um, it's a true pleasure and a privilege to be here today. Um, I wanted to thank Debbie's Foundation for actually having this here and for Dr. Kempmler for inviting me and all the organizers and especially thank um, the patients who were here earlier um, and with the courage to speak about their experience. Um, as a surgeon, I'm supposed to be tough and, you know, like rigid, but um, it was really hard to not uh, shed a few tears and be really touched by their sharing. I think it's going to help a lot of us and um, the way we um, care for our patients and our uh, family members. Today, um, I've been asked to speak about surgical options and update. Um, I am here um, from City of Hope, and uh, it's about 22 miles out of here. So um, first, I think all of us already know what gastric cancer is. Um, very simply, a cancer that can arise anywhere from the esophagus um, all the way down to the pylorus, um, sort of uh, cells that grow out of control. If left untreated, gastric cancer grows um, and it spreads, and that's why it's so important to be able to diagnose this early when it's treatable. It, the cells actually start on the inside and they eat through the, uh, the stomach wall, and as it goes through the walls, the risk of it going to other organs like lymph nodes and to the liver and to the peritoneum, to the omentum and lungs and sometimes bone occurs over time. The longer it's left untreated, um, the more chance and the risk of it being uncontained and un uh, very difficult to treat. So why do we need to know about gastric cancer? Obviously, all of us in this room are very interested in gastric cancer, and we are deeply cut and completely disrupted by this disease. Um, but uh, there are about a million gastric cancer patients being diagnosed in the world annually. Although the incidence in the United States is low, um, around the world, it's the third leading cancer killer worldwide. And as we... Um, come together in K-Town, I wanted to also share that it's the number one cancer killer among Korean American men. And a lot of this data comes out from LA. And even though the incidence is low, as you can see on the chart, um, the highest risk and incidence is in Korea, um, the, the prognosis of our patients in the United States is fairly poor because most of us are, are diagnosing our patients at a very advanced stage. And we know that um, everyone asks me, like, why did I get gastric cancer? And, and some people say, what did I do? Should I have done something differently? Well, I think 5% of the patients are born with um, inherent, um, inherited uh, genetic mutations that ultimately lead to cancer. But 95%, uh, we just don't know what the genetics are, but we know that it's associated with many risk factors that are listed. Some are unmodifiable. We can't do anything about our family history or the fact that we already have uh, chronic gast atrophic gastritis. They're not reversible. If you're a man, you're at higher risk. If you're older, it's a disease that as we get older, uh, more of us get, and the history of stomach polyps and certain things like ethnicity, we can't change, I can't change the fact that I'm Korean American. Um, but some of uh, the risk factors are modifiable, and um, if you were to change those uh, risk factors, we may be able to decrease um, the risk of getting gastric cancer, such as H. pylori infection. The longer you have active H. pylori infection, the higher risk of you getting gastric cancer. If you smoke, smoking is bad for everything, like heart disease and all different cancers, but it's also bad for stomach cancer. And as, as the dietitian talked about, um, Megan, salted foods decrease in fruits and vegetables. So just as, just the plug about Korean Americans um, is that the nationwide studies have shown that Korean Americans have the highest rates of some of these risk factors like intestinal metaplasia that are pre-malignant, atrophy, um, history of H. pylori infection um, compared to non-Hispanic whites. And you can see that um, comparatively, I think minorities actually have higher incidence of a lot of these pre-malignant and risk factors including the rate of gastric cancer. 
Um, so there was a pilot study that we did in New Jersey which support this as well and higher incidence of risk factors that lead to gastric cancer. Um, and we know that Korean men are at the highest risk of developing gastric cancer if you live in Korea. Korean Americans living in LA actually are four times more likely to get gastric cancer than our non-Hispanic white neighbors. And interestingly, if you look at this epidemiologic study, the incidence of gastric cancer among Korean Americans over 65 years old is um, the same as those in Korea, native Korea and as close to Jap Japan. So um, this is a, a, perhaps a way that we need to think about um, gastric cancer in ethnic minorities in the United States um, that's very specific to some of our communities. So early detection is really difficult. If you ask a lot of patients um, that come and get diagnosed, there is really very little specific symptoms. By the time you have very bad symptoms from gastric cancer, um, it's usually a very late stage. So early stage, they're asymptomatic. You know, you have some um, symptoms like reflux and treated by Pepsid, a, um, and 80% have no symptoms in the early stage of gastric cancer. It, it is kind of a scary thing. And by the time you have weight loss, um, nausea, difficulty swallowing, these are sort of advanced stage stuff. Um, it requires that we do an upper endoscopy to, and a biopsy to get a confirmed diagnosis of gastric cancer. And usually I see my patients after this diagnosis has been had. So there's really, everyone says, well, can I just get blood work? No, there's no blood work that we can use to um, yet. Um, we're working on it, but there's no blood work to detect gastric cancer in early stages. And by the time you can f feel a gastric cancer on an exam, it's fairly advanced. So what happens after diagnosis? Most of you who have family members have gone through this. Once you are diagnosed, you need to get staged. You know, you need to know how deep the tumor goes, and that's why you spend hours on the CT scanner getting the endoscopies, because as doctors, we're trying to figure out what stage you are so we know how to treat our patients. And proper staging helps determine treatment options and provides sort of a general idea of the prognosis that we will expect, and it helps us to discuss the way uh, we will be treating our patients and why. And most of these things, like endoscopic ultrasounds, all of our patients, go th a lot of our patients go through this, and you probably, if you're a patient, have gone through this. If you are a family member, uh, maybe gone to the endoscopist multiple times, gone through the scanner like 100 times. Um, but all of this is necessary so we know where the tumor is and how the, the tumor went so that we can come up with the treatment options um, that are appropriate for our patients. And so there's stage one, to, sorry, got a little bit skewed, but um, stage four, all of this should be a little bit. So stage one gastric cancer is completely curable, and the risk of recurrence um, is very low. So I think there was a, a gentleman in the audience who asked about, am I a survivor or a, a patient? And if you are a stage one gastric cancer patient extremely early, your chance of you having the cancer come back is, is less than 5%. So you're a survivor, and you probably will be a survivor for many years to come. Um, but for other um, stages, it's not just surgery alone. We need to combine the optimum treatments. And those in yellow are sort of the areas where surgeons kind of get involved and can do something, stage two and three. And the best strategy, um, the way to decide what is the best strategy is actually do it within a multidisciplinary team. You know, Dr. Chow and I share many of our patients together, and, but the team is not just the medical oncologist and the surgical oncologist, but as well like family members and friends and the nutritionists, um, radiation oncologists, anyone that we deem may be necessary um, to get involved or want to get involved in the decision making, um, leaving the expertise to the experts, but also being involved in all the decision making because every patient and the family um, uh, has a different way of approaching how to decide to go about getting care. 
So as a surgeon, what I love is to see a patient that I can operate on because I can offer them a curative operation. But this is um, only after, it requires like a complete removal of all the cancer that's in the stomach. And um, depending on, on where the tumor is and how deep the tumor went, uh, really is the extent of uh, the uh, surgical resection. You can have like half of your stomach, two thirds of your stomach, distal stomach, and all of your stomach. And many patients ask me, how do I live without a stomach? The stomach, you don't need the stomach to live. Um, patients do, obviously it's a traumatic experience and it's very um, difficult to go through all of the surgeries, but the stomach is not a necessary organ for survival. One of the important things about why we need to know the extent of where the tumor has gone, because the deeper the, t the cancer has gone through the stomach walls, the chance of it going to lymph nodes is high. And we know from um, studies now, which used to be controversial, but the more lymph nodes, the clearance of lymph node basins where cancer cells go, um, makes the risk of recurrence lower helps us stage the patient better, and to do a proper operation, this sometimes increases the risk. So you need to sort of balance the benefit of having a very aggressive surgery versus um, having a, a lesser aggressive of the operations. So, you know, I'm a robotic surgeon. Some people say I'm a gastric cancer surgeon, um, but my, there has been different options of surgical approaches over the years. Um, from something what we may think of being maximally invasive to something that's minimally invasive using, you know, smaller incisions. Um, but all surgery, I think, is invasive. And that um, it's a tremendous physical, emotional, and psychological stress, as our patients have um, shared with us, that every surgery that we do, because we have to maximize the effectiveness of the operation, it is a traumatic. And over the years, surgeons have tried um, to minimize that trauma to our patients, optimizing surgical outcome. And it's about 100 years it took from an open operation that Bill Roth did um, in Ven uh, Vienna, like 1881, to come up with some novel therapies and approaches that can minimize the trauma. So if you look at the history of cancer surgery for stomachs, I mean, for stomach cancer surgery, it was 1881 that was the first surgery, and it, they thought it was radical, and he, got, he almost got stoned for taking out someone's stomach at the time because the patient died um, later, even though the surgery was successful. In 1991, um, the Japanese surgeons uh, did the first laparoscopic operation with small incisions, and then the robot came about and um, the first robotic gastrectomy was performed in Japan and in the United States. And since then, Dr. Hyung in Korea has done the most, and he's the one that I trained with. So a lot of studies show, have been done in laparoscopic gastrectomies, that minimally invasive um, surgeries improve patient outcome, shorter hospital stays, decreased blood loss, early recovery. Um, there's many benefits for doing an, a, a minimally invasive approach. Unfortunately, it can take longer. It has a lot of cost, and additional training is required to be able to do the same operation through small holes versus a big incision. And there's been many studies out for um, robotic surgery for gastric cancer, but as you can see, most of them are from East Asia, from early cancers, um, and ultimately what they found was that there's very little benefit difference between laparoscopy and robotics, and it's sort of the surgeon's choice, although the robot costs more. Um, and it's in the United States, this adoption of minimally invasive therapy has been um, slow because for complex operations, um, minimally invasive approaches are difficult. Um, and a properly performed gastric cancer surgery is a complex operation regardless which approach. And so for the minimally invasive approach, uh, further training is required. And you can see that only 3.5% of the academic center surgeons are performing robotic gastric cancer operations, although this number is increasing rapidly because I've been around LA uh, proctoring 
um, surgeons who are being um, trained to do this so that we can offer this to our patients. And so it's balancing the surgeon's experience as well as the risks and benefits of minimally invasive therapy for our patients. My preference is to use the robot whenever it's appropriate because I think for me as a surgeon, um, it has many advantages over laparoscopy, um, better view, improved ergonomics, precision. Um, I get to control four arms instead of two. Um, and for my patients, it still offers the minimally invasive advantages that you can get from laparoscopy. So people have asked me a lot, my patients, like, what does the robot look like? Or who does the operation? Is the robot doing the operation? Are you doing the operation? Well, I am doing the operation, and the surgeons do the operation. They control, um, they sit at a master console, and we control the robotic instruments. Um, you, I think patients will, when they come out and wake up, they have these small incisions, but through those small incisions, big instruments go in, and um, this is what it looks like. The machines uh, have evolved over time, but they take up a lot of space, and that's my fellow at the bedside um, making sure I'm doing the right thing all the time. And then this is what the surgeon's work is in the operating room. Um, that's the view from the consult. It's, that is the left gastric vessel that I'm clipping, and it's a very good view. It's very steady, and once the surgery's done, um, when the stomach comes out, I take the specimen and I take all the lymph nodes because I really want to know if in those, I want this pathologist to find all the, the cancer that may be in the lymph nodes because that stages the patient better and will know how to treat the patients better. And not just, you know, just doing the surgery and saying that's done is really not the best way of optimizing patient outcome because surgery alone is not gonna do that. However, there's standardized and optimized perioperative care um, that's been coming out saying, including minimally invasive therapy, there's many factors that help a patient through their journey. This is um, a process that begins before the operation and um, goes way beyond after the surgery is finished and you come out of the uh, post-anesthesia um, unit. And it's included, for many patients who go through this, they may not know that this is happening because we take care of this and we interact with you and the patient givers. But there is a standardized um, sort of being studied to see how we can improve the patient experience. And this is very complicated, but all the fellows have memorized this uh, by heart because this is how we take care of our patients so that they can go home sooner and they don't, you know, they can have less drains and um, IVs and things like that over their course of time in the hospital. And usually it takes about five days after a distal gastrectomy and about seven days after a total gastrectomy for our patients to go home without tubes and at least eating something that is more than just um, like uh, small portions. So in conclusion, um, I believe that gastric cancer is curable, but it remains a very deadly disease that has um, known hereditary and environmental risk factors, as we know. Um, being Korean or Korean American over the age of 65 puts you at the highest risk of developing gastric cancer that is sporadic. Um, at the time of diagnosis, a surgery in the United States usually just becomes one aspect of a multidisciplinary treatment plan for our patients requiring other members of the team um, with more expertise in other areas to be actively involved. Um, minimally invasive surgery such as laparoscopy and robotics, um, when properly performed um, within a comprehensive gastric cancer program can help improve surgical outcome. Um, and we must work together to decrease the number of deaths due to gastric cancer in the United States and worldwide. And many smarter robots are on their way, robots that may be able to operate on their own in the future, but able to integrate our preoperative and postoperative care imaging uh, in and outside the OR, um, including Verb Surgical and some of these other places. And we hope that they're coming out soon. And their research for a cure uh, for gastric cancer continues, UCLA, City of Hope, Cedars, and many, many um, 
institutions around the country are searching for ways. But this, um, I think this research is urgent um, and um, we need to keep on going so that we can um, early detect gastric cancer and find new cures for advanced gastric cancer. Also, um, scientists around the world are hard at work to do this. There are many collaborations, including the one that I'm involved in as a surgeon, um, that we share our ideas or cross boundaries so that we will um, get to the cure faster. I just wanted to leave you with this, that as everyone is doing um, research and inventing new things, um, there are, I think all of us, there's simple formulas for living healthy and, and trying to um, prevent cancer, but they're not that easy to do. I think a lot of them has to do with nutrition and healthy living, um, those choices that we make, and also for knowing your risk of developing a certain cancer like gastric cancer, to ask the questions and go see your doctor um, and ask how your family history affects your risk of getting a cancer, about your H. pylori infection that you had and that risk of you having a cancer and discuss the possible options of not just the colonoscopy but with your risk, do you need an upper endoscopy as well? And thank you for your attention.